my name is Natasha Phelps. I'm a lead senior staff attorney at the Public Health Law Center, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but um, basically I'm a public health lawyer, and I work mainly in commercial tobacco control, but I'm really interested in talking about equitable policy, um, and sometimes that means talking about education law, sometimes that means talking about First Amendment issues, and so I picked a really good field to be in because I think when we're talking about public health, we touch on all those issues, which I'm sure so many of you in the room are aware of. Um, and so I really want to thank CADCA for inviting me to the um, leadership forum because it's my first time here, and specifically Andrew Romero, um, the director of Geographic Health Equity um, Alliance, because uh, we had you know, some experience working in commercial tobacco, and I guess, Andrew, you thought that my presentation was good enough to come to the forum, so thank you for that. Um, and thanks to all of you for coming to this room for this session. There are so many youth sessions and general sessions during this time that were really important and looked really interesting even to me. Um, and, you know, I'm like, do I have to present? I really want to go to this other one. So uh, thank you for being here today, and uh, I hope to make your decision to be in the room worthwhile. So today we're going to be talking about effective law and policy. And it's really that simple. It's about effective law and policy. And we could talk about, you know, drafting and specific definitions and formatting. And there are many aspects to effective law and policy. But today we're going to be talking about a vital, vital aspect of law and policy, um, which is equity and inclusion of equity at every stage of law and policy. So basically, I'm going to give you my insight as a public health lawyer as to um, how a lack of equity, a lack of inclusion at the different stages of law and policy affects law and policy. And so if you're in research, you'll, I'll talk about that. If you're in the identification of policy solution, the advocacy arena, I'm talking on that. I'm talking on evaluation, I'm talking on enforcement, and of course I'm going to be talking about drafting as well. Um, but I really hope that everybody has something that they can learn from the presentation, and I really hope to learn from you as well. Hopefully we'll have some time for some conversation um, at some point, and then especially at the end, a time for questions and answers. Um, and so that's what I'm going to go over today. I will be using specific examples from commercial tobacco policy, but if you don't work in tobacco, it's fine. Hopefully you still will have something that you can take away from the conversation. So today what I want to do, before we start to talk about how equitable policy is effective policy, is I want to get on the same page about some terminology that I'm sure all of you have heard or used. Um, but I think it's important for us just in this conversation to have the same understanding. So even if you have your own definitions, that's fine, but this is what I'm going to be talking about today. And maybe you'll find it helpful if you've already done your own training um, on these issues. Um, it might be difficult to work with other entities or people, decision makers on these issues, and hopefully this will be helpful, provide some um, language and talking points. So we're going to get on the same page about equity, health equity, and social determinants of health. And of course, health disparities, kind of how they all interact and what they mean. Then I'm going to do an overview of effective law and policy, especially public health law that is based in equity. And specifically, I'm going to be using examples and talking about how commercial tobacco law and policy is impacted by a lack of inclusion and equity, and specifically these things um, that are bulleted on the screen, which I'll get into, um, and be using specific examples in, to in tobacco control. Um, and then we will open the floor for question and answer, um, but maybe there might be an opportunity for us to talk in between. Before I do that, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about who I am and where I work. I work at the Public Health Law Center. Um, it's in St. Paul, Minnesota, on the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. Um, like I said, I'm a lead senior staff attorney today, um, and I manage a group of attorneys who work on Minnesota uh, tobacco control policy specifically, but I do national work as well. So at the Public Health Law Center, we have two teams of attorneys. We have one team of attorneys that work on commercial tobacco control, me, I'm in that group, and then we have another team team that works on healthy eating, active living. I'm not on that team, but they're great. Um, and we are a nonprofit law center, so that means that we can provide free legal technical assistance, which I'll talk about in a second, to anybody in this room. So if you emailed me, I have my business cards up here and I have more with me. If you email me and you have a legal question surrounding commercial tobacco control, I should be able to help you free of charge, and that includes a couple of different things, which I'll go over. Um, 
But when I say commercial tobacco, I want to be really clear. What I'm talking about are commercial tobacco products that have been manufactured and sold for profit, which, re which results in disease and death. So I'm not talking about traditional sacred tobacco use that has been used for thousands of years by indigenous people. We are talking about regulating commercial tobacco products, which is why you'll hear me say commercial tobacco products instead of tobacco. And that was something that we had to work on as an organization when we were looking at how we were contributing to the problem. Okay, and so when I say I can provide free legal technical assistance to everybody in the room, what I mean is we can perform legal research, which we do often. Um, we can also develop policy, law and policy at a local, state, federal, and tribal level, implementation of that policy, and also defense of that policy if such a policy were ever to be challenged in court. We do also write amicus briefs. If any of you um, are in the practice of litigation, we can also um, file those. We have a ton of publications on our website on various topics of commercial tobacco control, healthy eating, active living, and then we do trainings like this. We fly across the country and we do trainings to different organizations, government entities, community-based organizations, et cetera, hospitals, schools, you name it. What we don't do is directly represent any particular entity or person, and we don't lobby for any specific law or policy. So you won't, I won't be with you at any of the meetings tomorrow. <laughs> um, but we do all of our work um, on various jurisdictions, and so um, we do work um, with tribal communities, um, and then we also work on federal, state, and local um, policy. So when I'm talking to you about my experience, I'm not just talking about Minnesota, I'm not just talking about Minneapolis, where I'm from, I'm talking about um, the FDA, the CDC, I'm talking about the um, state of California, the state of Vermont, um, and I'm talking about uh, local jurisdictions like Washington, D.C. And all the work that we do is grounded in equity. And what that means to us is that it's not something that we do all the work and then we're like, okay, let's check to see if we've like, can just cross it off the list. No, it's just a part of what we do. It's just who we are. And we really check ourselves, like I said, in using um, terminology like commercial tobacco. We also understand that no one policy fits all. So we do not take a one size fits all approach. We do have model policies, but we provide free technical assistance to work with communities to pr provide a policy that works for their community. And we know especially that it's important with law and policy to understand those who are most impacted by commercial tobacco use, by health, that are facing the most health disparities, and to gear the, if you gear the policy towards them and in consideration of them, it will be an effective policy for the overall population. So that's our approach, and that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. So let's start by getting on the same page. I said our work is based in equity. So what are we talking about here? I like this um, definition here um, from PolicyLink. Equity generally, is the just and fair inclusion into a society in which we can all participate, prosper, and reach our full potential. So we're unlocking the nation by unleashing the promise in us all. So basically, I summarize this as we all win when we all win, okay? So it's acknowledging that there's potential in us all to live to our fullest and to be healthy as possible. And then health equity is similar. Health equity is the highest possible standard of health for all people and giving special needs to the attention of those at greater risk of poor health outcomes based on social conditions. And so again, we all win when we all win. And we again need to focus on those who need the most support um, to thrive on their own because this is not about not acknowledging how powerful, smart, and strong communities that are marginalized already are, but it's about giving them the tools that they need to be able to succeed and to be healthy. And so advancing public health is advancing health equity. So those two things are not different to me. So when you're saying, oh, I work on public health, I wanna work on public health, I'm hearing you say that you're also interested in working on equity because those two things are the same. Okay, so when we talk about health inequity, we're talking about negative health disparities, okay? So health disparities are, we have this data and we see a difference, we see disparate results um, in health. And so when we talk about health inequity, we're talking about health disparities that are negative and also health disparities that are totally controllable and unjust, all right? So this definition um, of health disparities was uh, provided by the Health Equity Institute, and it really ties together this understanding uh, that inequity generally also means um, health inequity because it acknowledges the systemic inequities and oppression that affect health outcomes. So, you know, public health, we don't work in a vacuum. 
everything impacts the work that we do. If you work in substance abuse, you are also concerned about unemployment. You're also concerned about housing. These things are just not siloed. Um, and so this definition acknowledges that. So let's take a look at what this means. So health inequity is the idea that health disparities are the problem. Um, and so we're gonna kind of break down the idea of health disparities. So um, health disparities among groups of people with an entire population that are avoidable, unfair, and unjust, that are caused by social, economic, and environmental conditions and inequities. So I'm gonna get into kind of an example but also an explanation of how that could work. Social and then economic and then environmental that results in a health impact. Obviously it can look all different and it's all tied together, but for the sake of the presentation, this is what I'm gonna do. Okay, so social inequities, let's just say, for example, social inequities that are micro and macro, whether they're microaggressions or something like um, institutional discrimination, they occur when individuals and institutions oppress and or create harm, barrier, and disadvantages based on certain identities like race and ethnicity, socioeconomic status, uh, physical and mental abilities, gender, et cetera. And so um, let's say then, that this social oppression that a person experiences um, leads to poor outcomes and less advantages, um, which leads to economic disadvantage, okay? So let's say um, you, know, you were prevented you know, through the law or from some various means of attending a specific school that you, maybe you could thrive in or, or be better. You were kicked out of school for some specific reason, maybe, I don't know. Uh, some type of discrimination or other social oppression. Um, so this could result in economic disadvantage like barriers to education, employment, and then barriers to financial assistance, perhaps being denied a mortgage, denied a loan, bank accounts, et cetera, and then perhaps even like lack of insurance or competent medical care. This economic disadvantage then leads to environmental conditions that negatively dictate your health outcome. So for example, you have you know, unfortunately significantly faced um, economic disadvantage, um, and now the neighborhood that you live in has poor air quality, water quality concerns, high tobacco retailer density, um, limit, limited or no access to nutrient dense foods, et cetera, and then also on top of that, stress, anxiety, and safety threats are high. So then on top of that, you have a lack of access to governance, political power, or the, even just the free energy or time to be involved in change, which you so badly want to see. So what happens then? The life expectancy of the residents in your neighborhood is 20 years less than those living in a neighborhood 10 miles away. And this is, this, we know this to be true, right? So for example, in New York City, which is highly segregated by race and ethnicity, people living in East Harlem have an average of 71.2 year life expectancy, while those on the Upper East Side, literally just a few blocks away, live to 89.9 years. And that is, that is something really um, to think about, um, especially when, when this tends to happen in um, segregated uh, racial and ethnic uh, neighborhoods. Um, here's what that looks like. So the average life expectancy for babies born to mothers in New Orleans can vary as much as 25 years across neighborhoods that are just a few miles apart. Um, and if you want more information on this, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has quite a bit on their website. So what does this tell us? So this tells us that the result of inequitable, disparate social, economic, and environmental conditions is desperate health outcome or health inequities. So when we work on public health, we should pay attention to inequity generally if we care to address public health. Um, and we don't have to figure out how to talk about this. Um, it's luckily already been coined. The social determinants of health are a really good explanation of what I just described. Um, and it goes beyond ex just those three things, social, economic, and environmental. It kind of gives a lot of details and gets specific. This um, uh, graphic that you see right here is the Kaiser uh, Family Foundation graphic, which I think is really helpful. But the Healthy People 2020, which is made up of the U.S. Uh, Department of Health and Human Services and other federal agencies, defines the social determinants of health as conditions like social, economic, environmental, um, in environments and settings like schools, um, neighborhoods, regions, and workplaces, in which people live, learn, work, play, worship, et cetera. And all of the quality of life outcomes from that situation. But note that they also include things like discrimination, racism, bias. And so let's also not forget 
to take these things into consideration from a historical perspective, right? So I think a lot of times in public health, we think about what's the most recent data, what's the most recent data, but we don't also consider what has historically happened and how that can impact what's going on right now. So talking about things like historical trauma, historical racism, historical misogyny, those are very important things um, to recognize when it comes to, say, for example, um, nicotine addiction recovery support and figuring out why the cessation support that's available isn't being used by the indigenous community or the African American community who may have a historical distrust of the um, American medical community. So these are just things that we should think about. Um, and so simply put, the social determinants of health is common sense, but it's also backed up by many studies. And it basically tells us that our health is determined, at least in part, by our access to social and economic opportunities um, and the quality of our lives, like the quality of our schooling and the safety of our workplaces, um, has an impact on our health outcome. Um, and it tells us why the leading causes of uh, death or for poor health in the US are chronic diseases that are largely preventable. Okay, and another term I wanna get on the same page about before we kinda get into the conversation, which I'm sure a lot of you probably know, are adverse childhood experiences. Because when we're talking about the social determinants of health, adverse childhood experiences kinda fall under that umbrella. And when I talk about um, adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs as they're um, called, um, I'm talking about experiences that happen to people under the age of 18 that are things like abuse, neglect, or other potentially traumatic experiences. Almost everybody has had one ace in their childhood, um, but the problem is that a lot of people, given their identity, again, have experienced more than just one. Um, and that uh, aces are really uh, linked to poor health outcomes, um, death, and disease. Um, so this is just something else to consider when we're talking about the social determinants of health. So why do health disparities exist in the first place? So we know, again, historic and modern systemic oppression, discrimination, and other harm. But also, what I'm going to be talking about today, there are statutes, ordinances, there are laws, administrative rules that perpetuate or even create um, things that result in health disparities. And we'll go into how that happens in the kind of bulk of the conversation. And when that happens, um, inequities tend to grow, and it's this vicious cycle of it not only causing it, but also not being acknowledged in trying to address the solution. So the problems just get worse and worse and worse. Um, and so today we're going to talk about how not to perpetuate that cycle in commercial tobacco, and you can take it into your other um, areas of practice as well. Um, and it's especially important to acknowledge this when we're talking about commercial tobacco, which um, sees some of the worst health disparities um, when it comes to the public health arena. Um, there are many reasons to explain this, but basically we want to consider the social determinants of health, and we want to consider the tobacco industry. And it's really important to consider those two things when you're working on effective commercial tobacco law and policy. Um, the tobacco industry has targeted marginalized groups that are underrepresented, under-resourced, and already facing significant inequities in every way for a very long time. And let's, I want to talk through an example, but here's a graphic from LGBT Health Link kind of describing the health disparities faced by the LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus community um, related to tobacco. Um, but let's, let's take a problem and work our way through it, okay? A specific commercial tobacco example. So commercial tobacco use is one of, if not the most major contributor to the three leading causes of death among black Americans, heart disease, cancer, and stroke, all right? Um, the fourth leading cause of death for African Americans is diabetes, and the risk of developing diabetes is 30 to 40 percent higher for cigarette smokers and non-smokers, okay? So we're keeping this in mind. We're seeing um, a lot of black Americans are dying from um, the impact of commercial tobacco use. We also know, which is odd, that black Americans usually smoke fewer cigarettes and start smoking at a later age than white smokers. Um, and they express uh, an interest to quit more often than white smokers. So that being said, why are they more likely to die from smoking-related diseases than white smokers? Okay, so now we're gonna, we're gonna figure this out together. So we know, again, industry and social determinants of health. So tobacco companies use price promotions like discounts and BOGO coupons, which are most often used by African Americans and other communities of color, women and young people, that are price, these are price-sensitive populations, to increase their sales. 
We also know that areas with large racial or ethnic minority populations tend to have more tobacco retailers located within them. And we know that the higher number of retailers that you have in your neighborhood leads to greater exposure to tobacco advertising. And this, in turn, increases the likelihood that you will start smoking, keep smoking, um, and it will also influence your choice of brands for tobacco products. So price promotions and coupons are also distributed at these retailers. So if you have a lot of retailers, not only are you being exposed to the advertisements, but you're also being given price promotions on the products, whether that's on the counter or being told to come in because the deal is on the door. Price promotions for menthol products are more prevalent in neighborhoods with high concentrations of African American youth. And menthol products are given more shelf space in retail outlets within African American and low socioeconomic neighborhoods. Why does this all matter? Okay, well the tobacco industry has historically and aggressively targeted to um, black Americans menthol products, especially in urban communities. Um, they've placed advertisements in black magazines. They've hosted um, festivals like the Cool Jazz Fest. Who's heard of the Cool Jazz Festival? Okay, it was something, they don't do it anymore, but it's something back in the day that used to be a big thing. And it was um, Cool, which is a brand of menthol flavored cigarettes. Um, and they've sponsored uh, things like pageants for young black women. They've really tried to target this community. And African Americans have the highest percentage of menthol cigarette use compared to other racial and ethnic groups. So it's really you know, not surprising that their, their tactics have really worked. Over seven out of 10 12 to 17 year old black smokers report using menthol cigarettes. And nearly 90% of black smokers overall, regardless of age, smoke menthol flavored cigarettes. The problem with menthol is that it's easier to inhale because it's mentholated and it cools your throat. It also cools your lungs, so um, unlike unmentholated products, um, you can hold, bring down the smoke and hold it longer, which means that you absorb more of the chemicals like nicotine, which is the addictive um, additive in cigarettes, making these products harder to quit and also, again, ingesting more of the chemicals than you would for non-mentholated products. So this might explain, when we look at you know, low socioeconomic neighborhoods, how the law kind of creates these situations where you have segregated neighborhoods and the tobacco industry is saying, we need to target this community in order to make a profit because that's, they have admitted that themselves. Um, so maybe this explains why um, tobacco-related death and illness is so prevalent in the African-American community. And so that's kind of the steps that we take as lawyers, as public health lawyers, to figure out what are the solutions to address that problem and why we need to consider those equity concerns. And so take, for example, um, this is a picture on the top left. I don't know if you can really see it, but it's from uh, count, a group called Counter Tools. Um, and it shows a tobacco retailer right across the street from a public elementary school in Baltimore. Um, and so it's literally just feet away, and then there's an advertisement for menthol-flavored cigarettes on the door right there. So imagine being a kid going from your house to your school and how many tobacco retailers you see on your way, and how many tobacco retailers you see on your way back, and how many tobacco retailers your parents might see if they're trying to you know, address their nicotine addiction, if they're trying to quit, and it's just like all over the place. Um, the Truth Initiative has a really good um, campaign going on right now that kind of explains how um, pervasive this is. Also a documentary called Black Lungs Matter is really good too, if you haven't seen that. Who's seen that? Okay, it's really good. Black Lungs Matter, it's very good. Um, also, uh, menthol products being sold for cheap in a place like that with price sensitive youth is really, again, no wonder why youth access um, these products easily. And then it resulted in an example like Mecklenburg County um, in North Carolina on the right. In Mecklenburg County, um, there is a neighborhood, and there's a majority black neighborhood um, that shows that you don't have to go too far to access tobacco. According to some research that was done by the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, um, as the number of black residents in a neighborhood increases in the county, so do the number of tobacco retailers. And so it's the inverse for white neighborhoods. As the number of white residents increase, the number of tobacco retailers decreases. And so it's really no wonder that, you, it's, that it's hard to, to quit. It's, it's easy to start. Um, and we need to look at these facts and figures to figure out what to do about it. And that's where the law and policy come into play. Um, so does anybody need to take a break, a stretch? You're welcome to do that. Don't feel, don't feel uh, like you're obligated to sit down, because I know the laws can be boring. 
Um, okay, so the disproportionate cost of some groups within a population when it comes to law and policy is a reason why we need to be very careful and intentional with our work. Um, so, for example, it's estimated that if menthol were, were um, banned as a flavor in cigarettes, like other f flavors in cigarettes were banned, um, about 10 years ago, hundreds of thousands of lives could have been saved. And so that was, that was a law that was written, that was advocated, that was negotiated, that was researched, and evaluation has been done since then. So these are, these are all things that all of you in this, in this room can, um, can consider. Yeah, so I'm just gonna summarize your question if that's okay. So okay, so um, so basically, she and what was your name? Jen. Jen. Okay, so Jen was saying that um, you know it's frustrating when you're working on commercial tobacco policy and you're working on regulating the sale of flavored tobacco products, but for some reason, you just either you start and menthol's on the list of flavors and then it gets taken off the table or it's never allowed to be on the table in the first place. Why is that, and, and how is that mimicking kind of what's traditionally happened? So what I would say about that is menthol is the bread and butter for the tobacco industry. It has been for a very long time. They've spent a lot of money um, to ensure that menthol is taken out of any regulation on the flavor of tobacco products, and especially when it came to the um, Family and Smoking uh, Tobacco uh, Prevention Act and Control Act um, in 2009. Um, and that was basically, that was a law that said no flavors in cigarettes. No flavors in cigarettes except for the menthol flavor. Which is crazy because, like I said, menthol of all the flavors um, is so much preferred with youth, not just, not just black smokers, youth in general um, when it comes to cigarettes, um, and uh, especially when it comes to certain populations. And the tobacco industry knows that and they have a ton of money. I mean, to be honest, the exception of menthol from a lot of law and policy is political. Um, sometimes, too, people push out um, science that is not fully supported that shows um, that, you know, products like e-cigarettes um, are beneficial for nicotine addiction recovery. Um, and might say, well, we need to include, we need to allow menthol to remain in these products if we're going to have adults switching from cigarettes to e-cigarettes, which is just what happened with the FDA's recent regulation on flavored e-cigarettes. Um, but the problem is, I wish I had a graph, um, menthol and mint is the preferred flavor of high school students in the country right now. So, I mean, I could talk about this forever. I think it's just, it's a frustrating thing, and it's really going to touch on what I talk about later, which is who's deciding what the deal breakers are. Um, and and, and we'll, I think you'll see where that comes in. But that's a great um, question and observation. Um, Okay, so let's talk about law and policy. What does that have to do with everything? Um, so law and policy generally is an essential tool for supporting and improving public health. At least it can be and it should be. And law in general in the form of statutes or ordinances or administrative rules or you know, whatever it is, a county uh, board um, resolution even, um, they have the power of the government behind it. So even if you're working with private entities, you're working with you know hospitals, or you're working with a mall or something, and they're agreeing to go smoke free, great. But when it comes to enforcement, it's like who who has the power, the authority to enforce that rule? Um, and enforcement, even though we don't think so, it really does impact the way we think about things and shapes our community. Um, and so they might, if a school district has a policy, for example, it will guide how the school will make a decision about a violation. Should we suspend the student? Should we expel the student? What should we do? I'll touch on that later, too. Um, but it can't dictate what happens on the sidewalk, even if it is a parent or a guardian that's visiting. Okay, um, so laws are powerful because they can reflect, reinforce, and shape the social norms in a community and our uh, community values. And so if I ask uh, you in the room, has the law impacted your life? Can you raise your hand if the law has impacted your life? I would hope everybody would raise their hand because whether you want it to or not, you're a libertarian or you know, uh, a democratic socialist, whatever, it does. It affects the air that you breathe, the water that you drink, um, whether you can vote or not, it impacts all of our lives. Um, and so this is especially true if you're a marginalized person, um, you know, as one of one or more of your identities. And so it's a ripple effect. 
And I just included these books up here because I could really talk forever about the law and policy and how negatively impactive, impactful it's been in our country and also how helpful it's been. And these are just two really good books if you're interested in learning more about that, um, The Color of Law and The New Jim Crow. Okay, but when it comes to public health policy, public health law, there are specific impacts that um, you know it's also good to be aware of: access to healthcare, access to services, access to products, um, also protections, rights, and liberties. You know, when we're talking about smoke-free policies, if there's some type of penalty, um, or you know, smoking cars with kids, if there's some penalty like a license suspension, um, retailers, there are protections, rights, and liberties that are also wrapped up in um, public health law and policy. Also resources, what's available, this could be funding, for example, at a state level. But generally speaking, what I wanna just point out is that law and policy can lead to these poor social determinants of health, like housing and all the things, and then, and then subsequently health disparities. So whether we want to or not, we are involved in the process. I wanted to also make a point about governance. Um, and it's really important to acknowledge who's involved in making the law, whether it's a judge, whether it's an attorney making an argument in court, whether it's a lawmaker um, at the federal or state or local level. Um, the law is really reflected of the people who make it and the people who are involved in the process holding those people accountable. Um, and we really wanna make sure that no one's left out of the process. So in the US, we know that law and equity has not gone hand in hand, especially when it comes to like the social determinants of health. But it's really important that even if there's like a homogenous governing body, that the, that the public it has access to and has the capacity to participate. Because just, not having access or the ability to participate in governance also impacts health outcomes. And so it's really important if you do advocacy work, if you do policy, you know, policy work, if you do research or evaluation, that you're considering these things, involving people. And I'm gonna, again, go through this in my um, slides. Um, this is really important too because you know I think more studies are showing that people who are experiencing a marginalized uh, life experience, like let's say somebody who is um, experiencing homelessness, short term or long term, um, somebody who has a physical disability, um, they have um, a lot of hardships that are something that uh, needs to be acknowledged and really also understanding that that takes creativity. Um, to navigate. And so there are creative solutions to issues that people with lived experience can provide that if you don't have that lived experience, you may not be able to provide that um, creative solution. And it's not, it's not to say that people can't be smart enough to think about creative solutions. It's just that there are certain things that you learn just by living um, your life in these ways. Um, and they're not like a badge of honor necessarily, but they also could be considered that. But the point is, lived experience should be at the table. And so at the very least, what I'm talking to you today about is intentionally advancing health equity in law and policy at every stage. And at the very minimum, I think that's just the floor. At this point, we need to do no further harm. Like that's just the bare minimum. That's not like, I know some people talk about that like that's an accomplishment because unfortunately and historically, I think it's been, um, I think it's been part of how the law has operated, but now we need to do more because if we wanna actually see solutions, we need to do better. Um, and this is just kind of a summary of what I've just talked about here. So law and policy impact our health and our opportunities to lead healthy lives in multi-layered ways. Um, and law and policy are essential tools for improving public health and improving the general social determinants of health. So if we somehow reduce access or um, reduce the impact of commercial tobacco use in the Latino community or Latinx community, for example, we may also have a ripple effect on the, um, uh, let's say, unemployment because of the health um, disparities that that would address. And we can't look at public health in a vacuum. Um, that's, I think, the most important part. So advancing health equity or advancing public health is advancing health equity and incorporating equity inclusion at every step of the law and policy process is important. And so now I'm gonna go through those policy steps and what I've seen as a public health attorney, if you don't incorporate um, equity and inclusion at those stages, what could result in the law that would be ineffective? So I'm gonna go through these stages. Research, identifying solutions, drafting, advocacy, the implementation of policies, 
and then the evaluation and enforcement of those policies. I'm going to go through each of those things um, and talk about how equity and inclusion inclusion could be considered, um, could be uh, brought in, and then how it might negatively impact policy. So let's first start at evidence, research, and expertise. So the first thing as an attorney that I notice when someone contacts me and they say, hey, can you help me draft this law? Uh, the city's trying to, you know, address this, uh, you know, commercial tobacco use or, or youth, youth are showing up to schools with these products and now they're tired of it and they want to do something about it. Or we have, you know, all of our affordable housing in the city don't have smoke-free policies and, and we really want to implement something that would prevent smoking in affordable housing units. Who is identifying what problems exist? Um, and then when you're identifying what problems exist, um, why are those problems being identified? So when you are identifying a problem, I'm wondering where the marginalized communities are in the process. Um, and so we have a publication on our website called Underserved and Overlooked, and it's basically about those who are experiencing short and long-term homelessness. Um, and there is so much information, again, to gain from lived experience of those who have um, experienced homelessness um, and how to have people who are or have experienced homelessness participate in research, not only to frame the research question, but also to, um, to participate. Maybe they don't want to come to the building to participate in a survey or something because they feel for, they might not have bus fare. They might feel uncomfortable or they might feel uncomfortable just not having showered if they haven't had access to that in a while. So what are some things that you can do in your research that involves people who have that lived experience so that you don't have these, um, these missed op opportunities? <clears throat> And then also, who are the experts? You know, I think in public health, we're always like, who said that? And you're like, the CDC. And you're like, Phew. okay, good, you know? <laughs> or you, you need some, some quantitative data to back up your statements, which is important. I'm not, I'm not disregarding that. But qualitative data has been important for a very long time. Stories um, and feedback from certain communities is very important as well, especially when it comes to this initial stage of framing the process. And so for me as a lawyer, when that gets missed, these are questions that I have and I'm wondering what are, what are the collateral uh, consequences of this law that I'm writing when I don't fully understand what's already been done to identify the problem. And so I can see that you would draft a law thinking that nobody's going to be negatively impacted, but they actually will because the research question was framed in a way that wasn't addressing everyone or um, they actually weren't involved in the process and so the wrong question was asked or questions were asked. And so having community-led research is a really good idea and allowing for qualitative data I think is really great too. Um, for state uh, health departments, I think, or any, any organization that provides funding to communities, providing mini grants for community-based um, studies on the utilization, for example, of cessation resources, I think is a really good idea. Okay, then moving on to the next stage. What, you've done the research, you've got some information, and now you're identifying policy solutions. Okay, so we know that this data exists, now what do we want to do about it? As an attorney, what I've also noticed here that's been really problematic in my opinion is the representation at the table, the lived experience at the decision-making table of what to do about the problems that you've identified through your research. So what might be popular nationwide, like Jen said um, earlier, is this idea of banning the sale of certain flavored e-cigarette products. That might not be the best option for your community. Maybe what's most impactful in your community is really focusing on menthol cigarettes, cheap flavored cigars, or maybe price of tobacco products. So really not kind of jumping on the bandwagon, but listening to the community about um, what they see from the research is really important. This happened a lot when everywhere across the country, communities were raising the legal sale, sale age to sell tobacco products to 21. Um, I saw a lot of communities doing that when I saw community-based organizations saying to them, we think we want to prohibit the sale of flavored tobacco products. We think we want to um, stop any new retailers from coming in the community. They were saying these things, but a politician who's never worked on a public health issue and are up for re-election, they thought this is an easy win because this is popular and everybody else in the state is doing it, everybody else around the country is doing it. So I, I'm going to do T21 and boom, it passes. And then they don't touch tobacco for five years. Meanwhile, all these health impacts are happening in their community and that's really harmful. So I would say having community buy-in and support is really important for that. 
Another um, aspect of commercial tobacco policy and health that's important for community buy-in are self-enforcing policies. So policies like smoke-free housing or commercial tobacco-free spaces, you need people to participate in those policies. You can't just expect to put the policy out there and then everybody's going to fall into line. Most lease addendums for private properties have language that say this is a self-enforcing policy. We expect all residents to report any violations of this policy in order for us to enforce it, blah, blah, blah. Community buy-in is really important because it it increases the likelihood of compliance, and it also grounds the community in saying, yeah, we do, we want, we want clean air to breathe. So let's all be together in that. And let's support people who are suffering from a nicotine addiction and talk to them about how we can help them. So I think, again, having representation at the table is really important. Finally, when you have identified a solution, even if it's a solution that is fit for the community and considers all people, especially those most impacted by commercial tobacco harms, um, you want to be very clear to the public, to decision makers, to advocacy organizations, that the policy that you're trying to pursue is addressing this universal goal of public health, um, but it's a targeted solution that specifically addresses those that are most impacted. Because as soon as you lose that messaging, later on when you're negotiating and you're identifying deal breakers, your intent was never established in the first place. So if a, a lawmaker says, we're gonna take menthol out, you say, no, no, no. Remember when we came to you and asked you to be a champion of this bill? We told you that the whole purpose of us doing this was to help um, the African-American community in our city, which is like facing all of these issues. And so that's a, that's a no. That's an absolute no. And we made that very clear from the beginning. Um, and so I'm not going to go through all these, but I just wanted you to know from the Public Health Law Center's perspective what we think are the most impactful uh, commercial tobacco policies uh, when it comes to addressing health inequity. Um, and Don't skip the that. Absolutely. So I think, thank you so much for, for that. I think that is absolutely key. That to us is deal breaker. We won't even write language. We will not provi provide language where that is included, just so you know, in our TA. Um, and I will touch on criminalization and um, other punitive measures in, in a moment. But uh, basically her point was don't pass over this idea of removing criminalization or not including criminalization or punitive measures um, because of the explicit impact on communities, specific communities, and also the um, um, uh, impact, the discriminatory impact it would have because of the barriers to making sure that those things, if possible, don't um, result in collateral damage, which is not really possible, especially if it's criminalization. But I will, I'm going to touch specifically on that in a moment, and I welcome your thoughts when I get there, too. Thank you. Um, so I want to talk about scope and drafting. Um, so that's where I come in most of the time. People are asking me to draft policy, to analyze things, revise policy. If you have a policy and you want to send it to me and say, can you just make some recommendations? Can, I can either change it or I can just write a memo or I could do comments on the side to talk about how to fix it. Um, but with us, what's really important is that the intention of the policy is very clear. So in a purpose and intent section, whether you have a school policy or a city ordinance or a federal regulation, you're being very clear about what the intention is. And that's not only important for litigation purposes, if you're ever challenged, that the court would look to that to figure out what the intention of the city is, um, but also because you, again, need to be very clear when you're passing sample language off to a decision maker, it's right there. It's right there. You're communicate somebody in the community says, Hey, I heard that you're trying to take away, you know, e-cigarettes and like I vape. Like, why are you doing this? Like I used to smoke and blah, blah, blah. Say, you know what? Take a look at the language because the findings are there about the health impacts of this product and how it's really targeting children. And you know, it's so it's it, it, it serves many purposes. But what I really want to touch on is the scope of the policy. So what is included in the language? Um, policies are effective if they advance equity. And again, at the minimum, do no further harm. And so we really want to limit exemptions for effectiveness and legal liability. So for example, if you have a commercial tobacco-free policy or a smoke-free policy, and you allow smoking in certain areas of the building, that is not an effective smoke-free policy because there is no safe level of secondhand smoke exposure. The US Surgeon General declared that a long time ago. Um, and also, it leads to compliance and enforcement issues. I could talk about that for a while. But basically, words matter. 
and I want to talk specifically about penalties. Thank you for raising that. Um, in commercial tobacco control specifically, and I think in public health in general, we really need to do a better job about looking at that. It's, I think, often something that is not considered when people are talking about commercial tobacco policy change, but it's something that we look at right away. And so a lot of public health policies penalize youth, whether it's a school policy, city ordinance, or state law. They penalize youth with underage purchase, use, and possession language. And I know this is true in other areas of substance abuse policy. So we really want to consider industry tactics. Again, um, I, I want to get into that in a second. Um, in the science of addiction, if we want effective policy, we want to stop um, yeah. kids from engaging in this activity of commercial tobacco use, making their lives more difficult is not going to be effective if the intent of your policy was to prevent that from happening. And so it's really just, <laughs> thank you, it's really, it's really just, it's not, we, you know, our mission is to advance um, health equity through the power of law, but um, it really is just common sense. And so um, also we're talking about high administrative fines generally. Um, you know, we just understand the science of addiction and how potential criminalization of poverty may almost come into, also come into play, um, especially when you're talking about violations against retailers. That's something we've been looking into lately. Most of the time, um, not retailers as the licensee holders, but the employees of the retailers that are often working minimum wage hourly positions. And if they are slapped with a citation for selling to an underage person, um, not acknowledging that they might also face employment repercussions like wage garnishing or uh, termination, suspension. Um, these are things that we need to think about. And then we do not, again, want to do any further harm by including um, criminalization to add to the mass incarceration issue that we all face in this country. And specifically, I just want to touch on school policy. I think a lot of school districts around the country, in light of the vaping epidemic, youth vaping epidemic, have turned to expulsion and suspension for students uh, using commercial tobacco in school. For example, one school district in northern Texas expelled, not suspended, expelled 23 students in one year because of violating their um, commercial tobacco policy. Yes? So I have to have a, in there, find where you have a lot of great Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, I think what schools are finding is that handling things like that, it doesn't work that way. So there are some articles that have come out recently getting some uh, research from schools, 15, um, about how this is not working. Um, I was in a session just a moment ago about uh, restorative justice in schools, which I enjoyed. Um, but uh, there was a one superintendent who reported in Wisconsin that the threat of being suspended from school sports, even by junior and senior uh, high school athletes, did not prevent them from violating the policy. Um, students who had, you know, scholarships on the line, who knew that they needed to be at their prime and also need to be there at the game for scouts to see them, did not change their activity. So it's really like, what do we have to do? We really have to think about the science of addiction and understand that suspending and expelling kids to send them home, to vape at home, to use at home, and then will have a negative impact on their academic achievement, only, again, increases their negative social determinants of health, which increases their likelihood of having poor health outcomes, including continued use of commercial tobacco products. So again, having suspension and expulsion um, we have a publication on it, to us, is ineffective policy. And we certainly, again, considering the social determinants of health, do not want to permeate the school-to-prison pipeline or mass incarceration, which schools really need to think about because when we look at the health disparities or the uh, disparate use of commercial tobacco products in youth and look at things like protected classes, like race and ethnicity, for example, uh, students with disabilities, if, if schools are being very harsh in their enforcement and it's suspending and expelling students, they should be very concerned that it could potentially lead to a discrimination um, liability issue. Um, and so really understanding that effective solutions when it comes to penalties, um, or not even calling them penalties, but support, nicotine addiction support, is really important in helping youth succeed. And that typically is what the school policy says is their intent. And so that then is what the penalties, penalties or the enforcement should be focused on, helping the students succeed. And that means nicotine addiction uh, recovery support. I also want to talk quickly about words mattering. Um, gendered language is something that we're thinking about. Like, why in the law is it always saying he, 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 
or he, even he or she. We can use ungendered language, it's fine. We can say they. Um, and so these are things that we're working on. Again, we, I say commercial tobacco to acknowledge um, traditional tobacco. Oftentimes in laws and policies, we see language in um, uh, purpose and intent sections which says tobacco is harmful. We want a campus free of tobacco. But you know what? A lot of people, indigenous communities, do not want a place that's free of tobacco because that's not really what you're trying to regulate. And you're not talking about traditional tobacco, you're talking about commercial tobacco. So it's something that we're trying to push the conversation on. Um, the next stage I wanna to talk to you about is advocacy. I'm trying to hurry up here so we can leave some time for discussion. Um, but at the, once you have the policy drafted and written, you've identified the scope, now you're going to push it and you're advocating for it. And it might be individuals, communities, community-based organizations, nonprofits, et cetera. Um, we need to ensure that advocates, whoever, whoever the advocates are, are committed to equitable law and policy. And that advocate, an end, end, because we know there's an end. Um, you know, we can't change right now what leadership looks like uh, most of the time. But you need to ensure that advocates from priority populations are involved in the advocacy process because if you don't um, and you don't ha have advocates that are committed to equity, you run the risk of having really important things that make a policy ineffective as bargaining chips, like menthol, um, like penalties, and like preemption, which I'll touch on in one second. So it's, again, this question like Jen raised, you know, um, is anything better than nothing? Um, quantity over quality, we just need this win. You know, I know some organizations that have that um, take. Well, well, we'll get this, even, it does, even though it doesn't have these components, and then we'll come back next year. <laughs> Many, I never see that happen where they come back next year and make it right. So, um, so then it also leads to rushed law and policy. So um, you also might have a situation where the industry, especially the tobacco industry, will come in and say, you can have Tobacco 21, but here, take this little preemption language and then we'll leave you alone. Who decides what the deal breakers are? Because we know that local authority to do more is an equity issue. Preemption has always been used as a bargaining chip that, by the tobacco industry, and they've said it themselves, that that is the number one goal for them when it comes to state legislative changes in commercial tobacco work. They know that the most likely outcome for um, communities who are marginalized starts at the local level, especially when it comes to certain things like minimum wage and tobacco. Um, and so they really started a process for other industries um, to really preempt local communities from doing more. Um, the uh, other policy area I wanna talk about is the implementation and education stage. Again, being really clear about what type of implementation resources can be provided to ease the burden of communities. So you pass a law that might, be hard, that might be hard for some communities to deal with. You know, uh, let's take menthol cigarettes, for example. You have an entirely addicted group of people within a population that now don't have access to their products, and it's going to impact them. It's going to have result in stress. It's going to result in feeling like, once again, they don't have control over their lives. So what in the implementation process can you include with, again, the decision and the um, input of the community um, to make it easier for them, not more of a burden. Um, and then making sure that there's access to um, nicotine addiction or cessation support. Um, lastly, I want to talk about enforcement and evaluation. Enforcement strategies, I already talked about penalties, but design enforcement strategies. You can be creative with it that reflect community values and don't perpetuate systematic oppression or disadvantage to priority populations. So things like graduated enforcement, the first violation is education and support, um, et cetera. Using restorative justice. Um, to really heal what's, what's happened, not just stick a Band-Aid on it and put somebody in jail. Culture as prevention. ACAF, the American Indian Cancer Foundation, has really done a lot of work with indigenous communities to talk about healing with culture. And so, you know, planting and growing traditional tobacco as a, as a means of prevention um, is something that you can consider and even include in the policy. Um, and then, again, it's a really important here, not you pass the policy, it's, it's important to continue those relationships that have been made with the community so that they can be in involved in the um, enforcement process. And then also signage to ensure compliance with policies. Make sure that it's in a language where the populations that are in the community can understand. Because even designs like you know the, the circle with the cigarette and the strike through it, sometimes it, um, even art is different to other cultures. 
And so also for evaluation, ensuring again that continued relationship with the community to figure out what's working, what's not working. Are you having increased um, uh, you know, interaction that's negative with law enforcement? Are you seeing people who are now, you know, maybe there's an increase in use of um, cigars and cigarettes because you've prohibited the sale of e-cigarettes. These are things you really want to know for these communities and understand these relevant factors, especially for those communities. So here's some of my key takeaways from my presentation. I won't go over them, but basically authentic engagement and inclusion as well as a real understanding of equity during every stage of the law and policy process is key and necessary to effective commercial tobacco control law and policy, and I would say public health law and policy in general. And so we must keep the social determinants of health, industry tactics, and science, especially when it comes to addiction, in mind when we're creating these policies because we're doing that to advance health equity, because that is public health. So there are a ton of resources on our website. If you are interested in learning more, there's a specific one about focusing on equity and inclusion um, that I put up there. But here's my contact information. I do have my um, business cards up here. If you want to take one, again, I can help any of you in the room. Um, so I'm going to come back to this, but right now I just want to turn it over for some question and answer. Andrew has a microphone if you do have a question. Hi, I'm Casey from Texas. So I work for the state and I do a lot of bill analyses during our legislative session. And I wanted to add in the scope and drafting words matter is really also thinking about the stigmatizing language that you might unintentionally put in. So we had a lot of bills come to us that had the word abuse and abuser and they weren't person first and things like that. So we were constantly revising that language to try and destigmatize at the very least what was going on. So I think that would be another you know thing to add when we're talking about he, she, they, what pronouns, and that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's a really good point. I just, uh, just to add on to what you just said, uh, we had a conversation about like the term marginalized communities um, and really wanting to use language that acknowledge the resiliency of those communities. And so that I think speaks to what you're saying too, like acknowledging those things that not only make it difficult for people to show up and participate and have health disparities, but also things that they are rising through um, and acknowledging that. So thank you, that's a really good point. Um, so, pol policy is one of my passions when it comes to environmental strategies, but I think I have a lot of difficulties with it, kind of what you're talking about earlier about how we don't want to do more harm, mm -hmm. and a lot of times it's, it's very difficult to anticipate the kind of harm that might happen with our policies, particularly for marginalized people. And I think that one of my difficulties that I'm trying to grapple with when it comes to policy is how to create these structures within our policies to make sure that we are kind of accounting for that possible harm that might happen, particularly when it comes to uh, historically oppressed populations. Mm -hmm. Because this is something that I recognize and something that you mentioned in your presentation was how we can create these policies and have these enforcements, but they're going to enforce in certain communities more than others. So how do we account for that when we're talking about policy? That's such a good question. Um, so, um, you know, I think it's a common, I think, I don't know if it's true or not. I don't think it's true that when you graduate from medical school or when you become licensed to become a doctor, they make you do the Hippocratic Oath where you say, do no further harm, make that promise. I think some schools make you do it, some don't. But the point is, obviously a doctor is, you know, if, if, with good intent, is not coming to a patient and saying, I'm going to do further harm to you. I'm, they're there to make you better, but sometimes that requires them to do further harm, like surgery, cut you open, to make you better. And that, though, requires consent from the patient, and it requires understanding and consideration of how, how the procedure is going to work. And so I think when it comes to that, when you're faced with a situation, I think especially in substance abuse, uh, when you're faced with a situation where you, it, you, you don't know. You don't know what's going to happen. You did all your research. You, you know that doing X thing could result in a positive outcome for the community. Involve the community and t be upfront and talk about that. And so that way, you know, you can say in the law or policy, this is going to, we're, we're passing a resolution. For one year, this is going to affect. And then when the one year mark ends, we are going to have a conversation and then move forward with this action. So laws don't have to just be passed and then be permanent forever until there's change. There can be a directive within the law or policy. I think a resolution is a really good way of doing that to say we're going to do this because we need to do research and figure out what's going on. So that might be one option to figure out if you want to move forward with something but don't want it to be permanent. 
Um, <clears throat> our state legislators are developing, uh, as we speak, this uh, law for legalizing marijuana. And I represent two coalitions in the Bronx, New York. They are using misinformed data research to justify social justice reasons. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And can what do you, you address do? that? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so I have two things to say to that. First, um, I was at a, a city council hearing um, when they were trying, in St. Paul, Minnesota, when they were passing their flavored tobacco regulation. And it included menthol. Um, and so what the tobacco industry did is they brought all these employees from retailers to come, and they were all black. They were all black. To, and, they, and they testified to the city council, my manager says I'm going to lose my job if you include menthol in this. I don't want, they, so they were very intentionally providing this, even though they didn't present any evidence to show that it would, this policy would result in job loss. But the people who were there, the employees that were there that were showing up, truly felt like they were going to lose their job. I was disgusted that they had done that. Um, and then also people coming from the um, you know, tobacco industry or the community who supports vaping, for example, and saying, you know, giving all these facts without any data to back it up, um, it's frustrating. I understand that. Um, I think all you can do is come prepared with community support and the evidence-based arguments and provide that to the decision makers. Um, and really that's all that you can do. Um, and specifically calling out their unfounded um, arguments. That's really, I think, the best way to do it. Another thing that you might want to consider is in the purpose and in intent section, like if you were um, writing a bill, for example, spelling that out, or if you were defining products, you can say, you say you're saying that we shouldn't include these products. You're, sh you're saying that we shouldn't do this because of um, you know, equity concerns, but here's, so, so fine, but let's include this data in the language itself, and now do you see that this conflicts? So I think there's ways to kind of manipulate the way you're drafting as well, um, if that's actually, if that's what's happening. And there's some hands back here too, Andrew, back there. Um, Are we time? I, I work in Hollywood, California, and, I, and basically, you know, the city of Los Angeles, and you know, we do our best to, to get the community out to, to, to do this kind of stuff, but all their meetings are during the day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And most of these people, number one, LA is a big city. Mm -hmm. So, you know, traveling from one end of the city to the other to get to this meeting to do some kind of public comment to whatever, it's really difficult. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm at a loss of what we can do to remedy that. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. Access to governance is also just participating in hearings as well. I think, um, and especially in LA, I don't think the public transportation is that great either. So, to get, but um, one thing, yeah. So just the time, energy, and capacity it takes to show up is hard, but. Um, I think that's really highlighting the importance of the advocacy groups who do have access and ability to attend, to have testimony from the community at hand, and not necessarily and speak on their behalf with with con um, with you know their permission, um, with their consent, um, to s or you know even a video like if they will allow that in a in a public hearing. I've seen that too. Um, so what you could do is create you know video or photographs or a report. Um, and I think that also having community-led research, which I talked about in the research realm, it's helpful because you're, you can hand over to the governing body a report that was prepared by the community with a suggestion for policy change. I've also seen that. So that could be a way to have them represented even if they can't actually make it. And then lobby for change that they don't have those meetings at that time. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. We are at time. Okay, so we're at time. I will stay and answer questions. My business cards are up here. Thank you so much. Here's my info.